for me, a trip like that, I think was a like a life-changing moment because you get to see what wow, people with yachts, buildings, you know, Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And you know, hey, let, let me go back and work even harder. I want to come back to Miami again. <laughs> it's flashy. I want to have a condo Miami's there. as flashy as it gets. It, it is, it is. But like it's just the lifestyle. It's it's just seeing these. Like we just took a trip to uh, to southern France and London and just seeing what's out there, right? It makes you want to work harder so you could go back. And I want to take my family, like, you know, my parents or my brother, my sister. I want to take them there. That's where your why gets bigger. All right, guys, another episode of Art of Greatness, and I'm very excited. We have an absolute rock star in the house today, not physically in the house, but virtually uh, with us. He is one of the biggest agents in all of the U.S., or runs one of the largest small teams, ranked 54th in all of United States, ranked 22nd in all of California. These guys sell hundreds of millions of dollars per year. He's personally sold over a billion dollars. He's a decade and a half plus in the business. He's a loving husband, a father, runs his family life, his business in a very tight ship. And I'm just excited to have him on because he's kind of defied the odds with the background that he has and really achieved greatness at such a young age. He looks like he's 30. Um, I, I have no My idea how old you are, George, exactly. <laughs> but I'd like to welcome George Ozunian from Studio City, California, Welcome, George. Uh, thank you so much. You did do your research. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, that, thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Um, really close to actually Canada, but in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, we will connect very soon at the Forum in Austin. Hopefully, I get to see you there. I Hell yeah, yeah. I, I've had it booked for, for some time. I booked the hotel and the nice. flights months ago, so I'm excited. I actually Love just it. got back from the Tom Ferry Conference and first time attending the summit in person, but it's just incredible what it will do for you and your business and just the way you think to be surrounded by like-minded people and people that are doing more than you, that are doing greater things than you. And I, I remember, and I'm kind of going off the cuff here, I listened to one of your podcasts and it's, you had mentioned this, you guys went from a big fish in a small pond to a much bigger pond in joining the agency uh, and being surrounded by these guys that are selling close to a billion dollars uh, versus it's where you were the you, top guy. You surround yourself with. It's who you surround yourself with. That's the bottom, bottom line. And that, that I am the proof of that with multiple different things, whether it's like in personal life, professional life, uh, in everything that we've done throughout our, our my, my life and career, in, in my friend circle, uh, I, you know, I had, I was surrounded with different type of uh, friends. And then I surrounded myself with uh, friends that were older than me, that were more successful than me. And I was the youngest guy in the group. And what did that do? Automatically got me to, uh, to the level that they were at or to be able to compete with them. Uh, same thing with moving from Keller Williams to the agency, uh, coming in into a company where everyone is doing things on a much higher level, uh, completely different uh, way of running your business. And what does that do? That really accelerates your growth. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big, big believer in, I'm a seminar junkie. So I love Tom Ferry's, my fairies, coaching in general, whether it's personal life, uh, you know, Tony Robbins, all of it. I've been into all of them and I suggest everyone to go to all of them. Uh, you get uh, you get a new nugget, uh, something new. You meet someone new in all these events. Uh, some of them I've done two or three uh, Pacific uh, um, I, I forgot the name of a Pacific Institute. I've done four times life changer. Every time I've went, I've picked up something new. Every time I went, it's the same seminar. But every time I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't listen to this the last time I was here. And you just change your perspective because you're in a different, uh, you're in a different part and mindset in your life. So you're picking up different things now, and you're meeting some amazing people along the way. 
Do you have a coach or do you guys as a team have a coach? We, as of right now, we do not. Uh, I have mentors, people that I've worked with, uh, people that I, I guess you could call them coaches. Uh, we meet, you know, every couple of months and we just discuss life. We discuss business. We check in on each other. Uh, several of our agents are being coached by Tom Ferry, some by Brian Buffini, just depending on what style of uh, coaching or prospecting they're doing. And since I've been into all these coaching programs, I, based on their numbers, personality, I tell them where, which coaching organization they should be with. Uh, you know, we, we should go back into coaching. I'm a big believer in it. Uh, no matter what level you're at, even the Michael Jordans, the Kobe's, the, mm. uh, the highest, highest levels of, you know, it's Santiago from our office, still coaches, I believe, with uh, Steve Scholl. So no matter what level in life you're in, you're at, I think you should still have that coach. You always need someone to check in with you, check in on you, keep you accountable. And if anything, just gives you ideas of how you can improve. We could always improve. Uh, there's always space to improve, to run things more efficiently, whether it's systems, uh, the team, uh, anything really, scripts. Uh, you know, our industry is always changing. And when you're dealing with a coach that's dealing with 100, 500 other agents or a big, bigger organizations that have thousands of agents, they're, they're talking about what these other agents are doing to be successful. How, where is this market heading? What's working? What's not working? And you'll be able to be part of that mastermind and get that information and pass it on to your office and to your team. So I think it's extremely valuable. Okay. Love it. Love it. I actually want to go back, right? Like, and that's where I really wanted to start, but sometimes things just flow as is in a flow state, as I shared with you. Uh, but I want to go back to where you started, right? You were born in the Middle East. You moved here at, uh, what age did you move to the was, United uh, States? So I was, uh, I was born, it's a, it's a long journey. Uh, was born in the middle of a war in 1985. It was the Iraq-Iran war. My parents' background was from Beirut, Lebanon. They moved to Baghdad, Iraq. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq. And I was born in the middle of a war. And that was 1985. And that war went on till 1990, 1989. Then 1990, 1991, you had the Gulf War start. So I think throughout my entire time that I was in the Middle East, we were in war. <laughs> I, I don't think there was maybe a year period that was there. There was no war. But other than that, the entire time from 1985 till 2011, when we left and we just literally like left our home, left everything that we had and just got in a car and drove to the next country just to get out. My father was in the military for 20 years and he didn't want to see us, his kids, go through what he went through. He went through, you know, he, he would start a new business and then there's a war. So they take him to the war. He'll come back. That business will close. He'll start a new business and then they'll take him to the war again and restart. He restarted, you know, over and over again, maybe three, four times in several different businesses. And um, a lot of my family have left by then. Uh, he didn't think anything would change, uh, but times proved him wrong and things started escalating and it wasn't a place where a father would want his kids to grow. Education is terrible and just not the lifestyle that you would see your kids grow up, growing up in, you know, uh, I could have been in the military. I could have been dead by now. Um, I could have been God knows where, uh, but my parents made a decision. And it's, it's such a tough decision to have, you know, they were in their forties, I believe, um, when, when they left in your forties to leave your home, your friends and your, you know, everything that you have and get in a car and to drive through the country to another country and go there and say, you know, I want to go to America. I want to apply for a political asylum. Uh, I don't want my kids to go through this. I don't want, you know, I was in the military for 20 years and I'm done. And uh, during that process, when we went to Jordan and applied for that, 9-11 happened. And that literally took our document process from 30 days to about six, seven months. 
my brother and I had to get jobs in another country and make ends meet. And uh, finally, our paperwork got approved February 2012, uh, just a little over 20 years now. Actually, February 2012, we came to America. I came to America knowing very little English. I'm not going to say zero. Very basic, basic English. And, you know, I've, since, since my childhood, I've had that. I've done several things to uh, be independent, to make my own money and sell things, uh, help people out if they're moving, neighbors, and make a little bit of money there. So I was always trying to figure out ways to, uh, to make my own money. And I've always known there is something bigger out there. And when I came here, you know, coming from the Middle East, you come here and you're like, oh my God, you're in America. This is the American dream. And it's sad because like you, you meet a lot of people that were born and raised here and they don't see that. They don't see what we see coming from another country to hear everything that they have as simple as just having food, you know, having all kinds of food available to you every day and having all these jobs and businesses and education and being able to really, it's all up to you. That's why we love this country. You could, you could. You could go all the way to the top, sky's the limit, or you could live, uh, you know, a, a good life. Being, being, some people are okay with that. So it's you could take your life in whichever way you'd like, right? And being surrounded with the right people. So like going back to that, I've had jobs at. Uh, yeah, I've worked a graveyard shift at Macy's, Macy's, yes. Yeah. Um, I've done uh, restaurant jobs. I've done. Uh, AT&T uh, door knocking from door to door, trying to sell U-verse and internet cables and just a lot of different things. But that's the journey, right? I've had to go through these jobs to meet new people until we, you know, I met someone that got me into the banking world. And that was, you know, that was like three years after we came here, three, four years. Uh, I went to school and it was really tough to balance school and having to work and uh provide and help my family um so i made a decision i said you know i finished high school here that was great went to community college for a couple of years and i'm just you know i'm just gonna go full force and work and figure out what is what is it that i'm gonna do and i got into a banking world in here in studio city actually at uh a bank right behind me washington mutual at the time uh, they went under the crash in 2008 and started doing mortgages there and met some amazing people, right? You get to see the wolf, the real wolf, and people are buying and selling and the deposits. And, you know, you start, you start opening up your eyes and networking. And as I started meeting all these mortgage brokers and it was a huge mortgage boom at that time, I was doing mortgages, but at the bank, you're, you're boxed into this, into this one program, right? This is, we could do one, two, or three. And other than that, we can't do anything else. And you have to have a good credit score. You have to have a down payment. So I, I met a couple of people and they said, hey, anything that doesn't work here, send it over to us. Anything that you can't do, send it over to us. And I started doing that. And, you know, they would take me out to a Laker game. You know, uh, we'd go to lunches and restaurants and, you know, they would pay me a commission. I said, wow, this is how much you guys earn? You know, that's it was like, yeah, uh, like, do you want to come over? And I went to a couple of mortgage brokers. And that was, again, the refi boom and the purchase boom and 2006, 7, uh, 8. And until I landed with one of, so Gina, my partner now, mm -hmm. that's how we met back in 2006, I believe it was. I met one of their partners in their mortgage company. And he said, do you want to he, he invited me to come over and he said, I want you to come over. You've been sending a lot of, um, a lot of, let's close this down. You've been sending a lot of loans over to us. And I think you'll do really well with us. And I had no clue about like cold calling. I was at the bank sitting and people were walking in. It's really easy for me. So he takes me there. There's like a big room with a bunch of people cold calling. This is what we do. We call people, we, you know, purchases, refinances, and you know, the, the pay scale is this. Based on like one deal that I closed with them, I'd make my monthly salary and commission with the bank. <laughs> so I said, you know what? I'm going to give this a chance. 
even though my parents said, don't do that, stick with banking, insurance, you have insurance, you have uh, your consistent pay. It's this blue collar job that they feel is a white collar job. And it's it's actually a cultural thing as well, which is is. the Middle Eastern culture, South Asian, very, very similar in that sense. You're working at a bank. It's a reputable, respectable type right. job. My son's a banker. Like that, yeah. that's what he, <laughs> although you make a, a shit salary and a little bit of commission right. versus I could make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, I don't think it's looked at that you know, it's, from that world. They have, I think they have a lot of fear in them because mm-hmm. they left a country, they came here and they hear about all these stories and you know, credit card debt and, you know, they, they want you to have insurance. They want you to have a retirement. They think if you go independent, you're not going to have that retirement. You're not going to be able to make ends meet, but you know, we have one life to live. And if you don't take these risks in life, if it doesn't, you know, if you don't take that step and say, I'm going to do that. If it doesn't work, I can always go back to banking. So, you know, there's always that, right? I can always go back to the bank. They'll take me back. I can go to another bank. Who cares? But I wanted to take that step, even though I was here like four years or five years from another country, broken up English, uh, didn't know much about mortgages. And what I'm good at is when someone tells me, like, here's the script, here's what you need to do, call these people and, uh, you know, ask them these questions and see if they want to refinance if they want to refinance do they know anyone else that wants to refinance if they don't are they thinking about buying an investment property or you know and well, i would just go through exactly what they said right i would just do that and things started clicking and we're doing better and better and better and i think my first my first year i was the top salesman there at their office my first year with them and they kind of as Coco and Gina, you know, I just got to know them. And Coco started, you know, his own uh, buying and selling real estate business and flipping. Um, and Gina was an independent broker running the office. We had a really, really good sales manager, Leonard. We're still friends until today. Uh, so it was like a tight family environment. And we had great times there, man. That was that was the start of our, of our uh, relationship. Or of our friendship. Um, I was single at the time. I was with my uh, wife, Rita, and you know we were traveling together. They're like, hey, George, if you close the most amount of loans, we're going to take you to Miami. I said, Miami? I've never been there. I heard great things. So I, I closed the most loans, and they'll get me a ticket to Miami. I would go to Miami with them. I'm like, oh, my God, look at this life here. And you know, these trips, some people go to trips like that and get depressed and come back. For me, a trip like that, I think was a like a life changing moment because you get to see what wow people with yachts, buildings, you know Ferraris and Lamborghinis, and you know hey let, let me go back and work even harder. I want to come back to Miami again. <laughs> it's flashy. I have a condo Miami's there. Miami's as flashy as it gets. It, it is, it is. But like it's just the lifestyle. It's it's just seeing these. Like we just took a trip to um, to southern France and London, and just seeing what's out there, right? It makes you want to work harder so you could go back. And I want to take my family, like, you know, my parents or my brother, my sister. I want to take them there. That's where your why gets bigger. If you don't have a big why, right? What is the big why? It's the purpose in life. What is your purpose? Why do you work so hard? Why do you wake up every day um, doing what you do, right? And if you don't write that down and know what it is, then you're still kind of lost. That's why you're not hitting your goal. But if you take a day or two and really think, what is it that you wake up for every day? What is your purpose? What is your goal? Are you doing the activities to get there? Are you acting like you're already there? If you wake up every day and dress up like you are a million dollar listing agent that you close two, three, four, five hundred dollars, five hundred million in business, every year and you run this successful team if you wake up every day and feel like it and dress like it and act like it you will become that person right it's a it's a simple simple uh it's called the be do half yeah be do half and also manifesting uh, it right like tell yourself exactly. you, you can do this or you are going to do this not just i can i'm fucking gonna do it and no one's stopping me and the only person that's usually stopping yourself is the guy or gal in the mirror 
that's really it, right? Like the person you're looking at, you're like, I'm stopping myself from not doing those actions. And even when I've fallen off, I realize I'm like, fuck, man, I could do better. I, I've messed up here. And if you, right. if you can self-assess to figure out, okay, here's where I need to be. Here's the mistakes that I've made. How am I going to get better and not make the same mistakes again? How do I right. figure it out? And most of us, like we have this uh, beautiful little phone and our why is usually on our, uh, on our uh, screen, uh, right? Like what's your home screen? Reminder. Probably like your mine's my, my son, my, my kids, daughter. My like, kid's picture. Yeah, Same my kids. E- exactly. Yep. Like right now it's one of them. I think it just got switched, but usually it's both of them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've got a son, a daughter, I think very similar age uh, to yours. How old I is your son? just turned two. Incredible. Just last week. Inc- that's amazing, yeah. man. Like, so, uh, you know, talk about purpose. That just elevates your purpose even higher. hundred uh, percent. And like, I'm such a big believer in manifestation and uh, writing your goals down and affirmations. And, you know, that happened through, I didn't know any of this crap. And I wish someone told me that I'm going to be like this with my son on educating him on manifesting affirmations, goal setting, uh, like a sergeant, (laughs) but you know, schools don't teach you this, right? They teach you this later on in life. I don't know why. But they don't teach you how to manage your money either. They don't teach you how to manage relationships. They don't teach you how to manage your money. They don't teach you how to invest, how to think bigger. They teach you to go get a job and work for someone instead of trying to start your own business and define the odds. If you were still working at the bank today, great, you'd have that job. Maybe you're making a hundred grand, but you're not making hundreds of thousands or millions or selling hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, it just would never happen because there's always, and and I come from corporate as well, right? Like there's always that glass ceiling. I was the director of operations for Saks Fifth Avenue and I knew there was a ceiling. Like even if I got promoted, there's still a ceiling. I know what I can make here. I can make in a month what I made in a year. And that's the difference. Like you can make that in one deal in California. No, this is not geared towards some people love that they want the the security they mm-hmm. like they like their consistent pay and they're you know they're happy with that and that's great you're blessed that's awesome some some others just want more and again it's not easy no one could just leave the bank and go you know sell real estate and become very successful you know what it is twenty percent does eighty percent of the work right that's a it's very true. very true statement uh, so you could get into real estate. You could sell three, four, five homes. You'll make good money. You'll probably be still, <laughs> you'll, you'll still make more money than the bank, and you'll have a lot more flexibility on your time. Uh, but you know, some people just love uh, and okay are okay with that consistent income, the security they have, insurance. Uh, maybe they want to go up the ladder. Maybe they want to stay where they are, and that's completely fine. That's why there is different personalities and different wants and needs uh, that people have in life. Uh, but I think everyone has so much more potential, including me and you, than they think. We could do a lot bigger things than we think if we really want to. Uh, and it just, you know, as you get older and you have kids, as you know, your time just goes from, you know, all day to shrinking. And now you have to do more in less time. So like that, that's another difficult thing that I've been trying to manage recently. But just going back to 2007 and eight. Um, so I, you know, I've, I've done mortgages with them. Market was great. And I thought, man, this is, this is going to be it. Right. And I didn't know anything about like crash or defaults and, you know, none of that. And to be, to be honest with you, no one really told me to manage my money. So I was out there, I'm like spending, cause I thought this is gonna be, you know, for life, I'm gonna make this much money, right? And that was a that was a big aha slap in the face moment in my life that it's not gonna always last, right? And, you know, we were waiting on a large check, our entire brokerage, we're doing several different states. So whatever we do in California, we're okay, but anything we do out of state, we have to go through a different brokerage. And we're waiting on a really large check when the crash happened. That company filed bankruptcy. No one got paid. And when that happened, I was obviously spending a lot of money at that time. And I was waiting on that check to come. And I was like, You're spending the money you don't have right now. You're like, you know what? I got this money coming in. Let me just just pick this up. I got a lot of money money coming in. It's all good. Don't worry. Put it on a credit card. card. It's all good. good. Um, And that check didn't come. 
They filed bankruptcy. Market crashed. No one is going to refi. It's a shit show. And I'm like, wow, what do we do now? Right? Literally like back to basics. And then, you know, Coco and Gina at the time were like, all right, well, I guess loan modification is a thing now where anyone that defaults, you get to give them a loan modification. We started doing that. It was a, it was, it was a challenge um, as banks started offering that service. So I, I left. Uh, I left and Gina and Coco were really sad. I still remember Gina crying when I left. She said, no, I thought we we're going to be always forever together. And I don't know what. And I said, you know what? You never know what happens in life. Uh, maybe down the line, I get to come back. So I, I, I leave, I go to uh, Wells Fargo, things didn't work out. I go to Bank of America. They were doing great with loan modifications, loss mitigation, foreclosure department. I did all that for about three, four years and was doing really well. But again, it was that banking job that was consistent, but not giving me what I had during, during the mortgage boom before the crash. So things started going, getting better, right? 2010, 11, I, my parents kept telling me, stick with banking. You saw what happened in 2007 and eight, it could happen again. And you know, bank is where you need to be, consistent income, you got nothing to worry about. I said, you don't want to listen to you guys. I wanted to get into real estate at the time. I kept talking to Coco and Gina and like, you know, why don't you get your license? And I, I didn't. I left Bank of America because loan modifications were dying out and went to uh, Chase Bank. Mortgages are back. Uh, I got into underwriting and mortgages. And six months later, Chase Bank shut down their entire department, laid off about uh, three, 400 people, and moved the whole operation to Utah and Arizona. When that happened, you know, a lot of people that were working with me, Oh my God, I wanted to open up this kind of a business and it never happened. And I think this is a sign. So I'm going to go do that. I said, that's awesome. Good for you. And I thought about it. I took about a month off trying to think, what am I going to do? I could always go back to another bank, but do I really want to do that? And, you know, I didn't have a lot of money at the time to start in real estate because everyone was like, oh, you need six months of reserves. And, you know, I, I didn't have that. Uh, so I went and cashed out my 401k. I took a 40% penalty. So I gave them 40%. I took the rest out and I said, this is what I have. I'm going to get into real estate and it's either going to do, I'm, I'm going to do everything in my power to make this my career. It's either going to work or it's not going to work. If it doesn't work, I'll go back to banking. If it works, I'll stick with it. So I went into this business in a way where a lot of agents didn't get into the business is, you know, you're going in all in and you have no option B. You don't have a rich dad or mom. You don't have uh, business managers, uh, wealth managers, attorneys that are going to feed your business. I've known a small amount of people at that time that knew me for doing mortgages. They didn't know me for doing real estate. Uh, but you know, I, I said, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to do everything I can to be really successful at it. And I got my license and I went and joined Gina right away because I knew she's running her own brokerage. And, you know, I, I thought that was the first best choice. Coco was flipping houses still. And uh, the first thing I did when I got into real estate is sit down in front of the phone because we did that in mortgages, phone call day and night, and uh, try to find distressed sellers for Coco so he could buy it and uh, remodel and sell it. So I did that for about three, four months. It worked okay. I've learned a lot, but I have I wanted more. And I said, you know, they had a really small operation running out of their house and I wanted to be in a big office with a lot of agents. So I said, Gina, Coco, I love you guys. Um, I think I'm going to go to Keller Williams. I've known a couple of people there. I'm going to join a big team there. And let's, let's stay in touch. I'm still going to call for you, uh, but I'm going to work out of there. So I came to Keller Williams in Studio City. And it's something that I, you know, I would recommend to everyone. First thing you should always do when you get into real estate, find a team, find a mentor that's successful and experienced to teach you, get you on your feet, tell you exactly what you need to do. And then you can decide if you should stick to that team or, you know, move on and be solo. And that's what I did. And it was one of the best decisions I've done in my life is joining uh, a team here, a large team in Studio City 
that literally gave me the basics of what I should be doing as a real estate agent. So let's start farming. Great. Well, what do I farm? Oh, Sherman Oaks. I don't know anything. I don't know anything about Sherman Oaks. So let's learn about Sherman Oaks, the streets, the schools, the, the community, the price per foot, what's selling. And we picked about 500 homes to door knock. Um, so I started door knocking. I was call calling. I hired a Mike Theory coach right away for call calling. And I was door knocking. I uh, put in money on Zillow right away. Anyone that told me that this is what you should do, I did it. Right. If someone told me, like, do this, put your money on this, I would do it. <laughs> so, like, I, I want to do everything I can to, like, literally accelerate my career in real estate because I knew I have about like six, seven months to close a deal or else I'm going to be out. I don't have a lot of time. Um, and this was in 2013, 14. Um, things were just started picking up here in LA. And literally, month five, six, I haven't closed anything. Uh, I was running out of money and I closed my first deal. And that was in, uh, I think, towards the end of the year in November or December. And I closed my first deal. I said, literally, like, thank God I closed this deal. Because if this deal did not close, I would have been out of this business. I still remember it was a property in Altadena. Friends of a friend wanted to, you know, purchase an investment property, a duplex, and went out there, showed it. They liked it. And, you know, we ended up going through it and closed that transaction. Uh, took about, you know, that, that was month six. And I said, okay, great. So one down, where do I get my next one from? <laughs> right? So like, what do I do next? And I just, it, real estate could be really simple if you do the work. So I was the first one into the office, last one out. There's several agents that, you know, we're still friends. They still see me. So Jordan, I always remember you're the first one there before anyone, the last one out. And I, the reason I did that, because I had, I had, I didn't have an option B. I needed to make this work. So I'm there at 7, 7.30, role playing, uh, uh, practicing on my scripts. By 8.30, 9 along on the phone, calling expires and cancels, circle prospecting. Go out in the afternoon, I'm door knocking. I didn't have a lot of family and friends to feed me business. Then people are like, well, why don't you go talk to the lenders that you knew? Maybe they'll send you business. Now I started taking all these lenders out to lunches and say, hey, you know, we used to do mortgages. Now I'm in real estate. If you need anything, please let me know. Started networking. And at the same time, you're seeing all these people doing these much bigger things and meeting builders and selling new constructions. And, um, you know, I, I stayed in that team for about a year. Uh, I did about 11 transactions after I closed my first one. And only one of them came through the team. And I said, you know what? I think I could do this on my own. And I'm going to give it a try on my own. I, I think I have everything I need to go on my own. And I, I, I branched out and I went solo and I just stuck with the same routine, the same practice. And I changed coaches from Mike Fury to Steve Scholl because I thought, you know, cold calling wasn't working out very well. I was door knocking, targeting builders and teardowns, did the Steve Scholl thing. Then I looked at my business trying to see where this business is coming from. I had a different coach at Keller Williams at the time. And about 70% of my business was coming through referrals, different people. She's like, George, I think you're focusing on the wrong bucket here. You're like busting your ass, call calling and door knocking, but you're not doing anything to your sphere, but they're sending you a good amount of business. You're likable. They like you. You need to do something about them. That triggered something new to me is CRM database. Let's get organized and let's focus on our family and friends. I still did the door knock and the call calling, but not as much as before. And uh, just dialed in and stayed focused on my database and try to uh, touch them multiple times. Email, postcard, social media, uh, lunches, dinners, gifts, anniversary gifts, birthday gifts for anyone that I think will be a, a, a buyer or seller or a referral source. And that elevated my business on year three, I believe it was. And I started getting busy. Now we're closing 22, 24 transactions I'm on my own. All right, what do I do? Let's, you know, I had a good friend that was helping me with open houses. Let's start a team. I guess that's the next thing to do. <laughs> uh, 
And I know I've known nothing about running a team, nothing, zero. So I, I, I hire a buyer's agent and I thought that would be the right, you know, hire at the time. And this first hire should be that. And I read, you know, a couple of Gary Keller books and, you know, how your first hire should not be a buyer's agent. It should always be an assistant. Assistant. Yeah. And yeah, it doesn't matter what, you know, if you're a new agent, a seasoned agent, you should always have that assistant as your first hire. I'm like, all right, well, I guess I need an assistant. So, you know, now I hired an assistant and that, that was, that freed up a lot of time for me to stay organized, to focus on, uh, me growing self-growth, going to these seminars, coaching events, meeting other bigger agents. And just, you know, when you have that hunger, that desire, and you start wanting more life, having bigger goals, uh, you know, one, one life changing moment for me is, you know, I was at a seminar and the coach that was giving the seminar said a couple of things. One of them was start with the end in mind, meaning when you're gone, what do you want people to say about you? What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? What did you do in your career? How much did you give back? How many people's lives did you change? And how many people do you see at your funeral? And I, I got goosebumps again talking about it right now. Uh, and he said that and I just fucking mind blown, right? And I'm like, wow, I, not a lot of people think about that. Who the hell is going to think about their death? And <laughs> but, but it's not, you, you're not thinking about your death. You're thinking about what are you leaving behind, right? right. What, are, what are people going to say about you when you're gone? If you write that down in detail and figure that out, life changer, right? The other thing was, is every year for the last seven years, I've been writing a letter to myself as if the year ended. So, you know, I, I you know, January or December of last year, I wrote a letter as if 2023, right? Yeah. Ended and talk about what did you do throughout the year? How did the year go? Um, how did you grow? How much money did you make? What did you buy? What kind of car? What color? Did you buy an investment property? Where did you travel to? Who did you travel with? What kind of friends did you make? Who did you give back to? Who did you help grow? It, 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 you just, the more details you have on that letter that you're going to write to yourself. And this is another mind blowing moment. Cause like I started doing it and I think it was year three, uh, where I, I wrote this letter very detailed. And I think about 50% of the things that I wrote on there happened. Sometimes things might not happen that year. It might happen the second or third or seventh year, right? But when you start in that habit, you could do a 30-day letter, a 90-day letter, a six-month letter, a one-year letter. Well, you know, I've been consistent with my one-year letters. Um, and you're, 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 you're starting with, I, you know, I am, right? Like an affirmation, like you've already done it. This the year is done and this is what you, you've accomplished. Mind blown about the results that came from that. I would recommend it to everyone. Uh, I would highly recommend that. So these, these are the things that happened in my life throughout my journey that got me right to, to where I am. And as a, I was building a team at Keller Williams, um, G, you know, I started doing really well. I was a 30, $40 million agent in volume. Gina was doing about the same on her own. And she met a meal at the time from the Calabasas office. And, you know, he talked to her. She lost a couple of listings to the agency, three, four million dollar range in Calabasas. And she thought about it and she said, you know what? If I can't do it as an independent broker, I might as well just join them and get these listings and be around the meals, the bigger agents that are doing 100, 200, 300, 400 million in volume because yeah, I am an independent broker. I get 100% of my commission. But if I go here and I do 100 million, 200 million, it's okay to give out that 20% to the company because to help you elevate, right? Uh, same thing happened with me and Keller Williams. People thought I was crazy for leaving because they have a capping model. I like 25K? What's the cap? 25K. Here? I could write a check in January for 25,000 to Keller Williams. I will make 100% of my commission for the rest of the year, right? Incredible. So, you know, I, I wanted more. 
and I saw her transition there. She was there for about a year and started doing really well. She had her own, you know, small team. And I said, you know what? I chatted with her and she said, why don't you join? I ended up joining Studio City and people thought I was crazy. I said, it's, it's not about making 100% of your commission. It's about being surrounded with people that are doing this on a much higher level. We wanted to get into the luxury market. We wanted to surround ourselves with a luxury brand, with a brand that um, agents collaborate and help each other. And I could call Santiago from Palisades and say, Santiago, you know, can you come to this listing appointment with me for 20 million and he'll come with me and we'll get the listing and we'll co-list it together. That does not exist in these other brokerages. Everyone is you know, working in their own little cubicle and office and they're doing their own thing. There is no communication and collaboration. But wow. you're also not taught so, this getting into the industry, right? You're taught that, hey, uh, keep as much money in your pocket. Uh, get the best splits that you can. And the splits mm -hmm. completely secondary. And I realized this. So I left a brokerage that I was with where I got 100% of my commission. So I, I had no cap, no nothing, like 100%. Right. I paid. Oh, no cap. <laughs> like, there's nothing. There's, there's nothing. I, I Just... paid 550 a month. And I get to keep a hundred percent of my commission. And I left that to come here and to give up. Uh, obviously, you know what we give up. It's across the board. Uh, but I feel like it's really helped me elevate to a different level. And I loved, and I contemplated even, and I want to share this because I contemplated last year. I'm like, am I going to spend $5,000 and go to the forum? Because it does cost money out of pocket, right? So you pay yeah. for your flight, you pay for the form. You pay, and then you have to pay for your dinners while you're there and drinks, whatever else. I don't drink, so a little bit cheaper for me. Uh, but yeah, the cost of entry is what forty five hundred to six thousand Canadian. Let's say thirty five to your five. trip right now to to the summit. Yeah, that costs a good amount of money. Yeah, same that, thing. So it's like, it's why are you thing. you're investing money in yourself? In yourself. And I'm so glad that I went because guess what? I could call up George or send him an email and get him on a podcast. That's inval right. invaluable to me. If I have Absolutely. a referral, I can call up Santiago and be like, hey, can you take care of this? Or just to be able to bounce ideas off of each other. I remember um, I was chatting with John Groman and Ben Balak. And anytime I was chatting with them, these girls would come by flocks of people and they all just want to fucking take selfies with them. Right. <laughs> they're like, cause they're on TV. So buying the bills. yeah, buying the, Hey, can you take a picture of us? And I remember chatting with Ben after three days, I think we were at lunch together two of those days and I couldn't even get a word in. He was busy. It is what it is. And I know my place. I understand. But that third day I'm just standing with him. I'm like, honestly, I'd rather just have five minutes of his time because what's in here is way important than one of these for clout. Right. And it could give me ideas of how I can manage my business better. Right. So I bounced ideas yeah. off John and he's like, make sure you talk to Ben. I spoke to Ben and they said the same thing. They're like, make sure you hire an assistant. Uh, and that was that similar conversation, right? Don't go hire agents. Agents make this mistake starting a team. And that was the idea. And I decided, I was like, okay, what do I need at this point in time? And I decided to hire two assistants, one full-time, one part-time now. And it's worked out really two. well. <laughs> yeah, I've got, yeah, one does my That's video awesome. editing, right? Like, there you go. I remember there after you go. I recorded the first podcast, I'm like, fuck 15 hours. Do I like, do I don't have now? time for this shit. I got two kids. I'm not an editor. I'm like, yeah, right. like, take this off my plate. I'd rather pay you and just buy for my sure. time back, right? And That's now it. there's- Our time our is time way too valuable. Too valuable. To, it's, you know, you, you, you got to figure out what your dollar per hour is and what you should be focusing on. So you can always leverage these things. Exactly. And even now, like, you don't know this, but about an hour and a half ago, I was in Oakville an hour away and I had a showing. I had to make sure I was at that showing. And that's funny because that was an expired that we door knocked. We uh -huh. had the client's number. We became, I guess, close with the client. And then we had a buyer from one of our other properties um, who we weren't representing, oh but we had the seller's number. So we called them up, signed an exclusive for one day, $12 million listing, and we got to go present this property. Showed up half an hour before Beautiful. the listing. He walked us through the property, and he's also a builder, actually. Um, absolutely oh. stunning job that he did. Walked us through, and literally everything he said to me, and he said like 100 things, I repeated them exactly within that one shot to present it. And even he was impressed. He's like, you remembered everything. 
I'm like, yeah, that's just, that's, but that's I, talent, we, we have one shot. So you have your shot, you yeah. have your opportunity, you take that fucking opportunity. And there was one- now, Whether that buyer is gonna buy that house or not, the fact that he saw what you did and the, the way, way that you showed just home exactly how you presented it, that already sold you. So if he doesn't end up buying it, he'll list it with you. Or he might ask you to list his in the next new construction. Exactly. Right? And that's the one thing that kind of went off in my head. I'm like, this is, we're on stage. And it's funny because my partner asked me, she's like, Fahad, you were on fire. She's like, you, um, she's it's like, so you, you were telling me you were so tired and exhausted. <laughs> I'm like, I am fucking tired and exhausted. Right. But, I am tired. Uh, but when I'm in front of a client, all this energy comes. Yeah. Or in front of the camera, you have to bring it, right? If you just, yeah. if you just sit back and you're like, yeah, we're here. Let's, no, I want to make right. sure we're, we're selling a lifestyle here. It's no joke. Right. And it's funny because we had this yeah. other one that we're showing tomorrow to the same clients. This one's seven and change and uh this was just a random door knock we were driving by i was like i love this property let's door knock it let's that's door knock how it. i i swear I this it. was the one I random i was like this is beautiful it's a hundred foot by 200 foot or one by 150 lot in south oakville as well uh but door knocked it and i ended up just having such a nice report with the homeowner but that's what separates you from everyone else is and other successful agents is we do the things that everyone else doesn't want to do. Yeah. We pull our car and go and door knock because that one door knock is such a big deal. $7 million. They could refer you another buyer or seller in that price range. You could double end that deal. It's, it's, you know, it could change some people's lives, but it's doing that step, that, that, that small step, right? Funny. I hadn't spoken to her in four months since I had her number. I just remember. And, uh, Alexandra is my partner. She asked me, she's like, Hey, Fahad, do you remember that, uh, door that we knocked and she just drew the street a house on the left i'm like we've door knocked like hundreds of houses how the fuck do i remember this and then she's like she had brown hair and i'm like are you talking about jacqueline and i just i type it in my phone i have her name i have her address i'm like boom that's the client i call her up and next thing you know she's she might even want to sell her house she's like actually I might sell but i need to find this is what i'm looking for right. if you can find this for me i'll sell my house and i'm like you know what I, I, I love, I love that story and going back to, uh, the expired, how you connected the buyer and the seller. I tell this to my team all the time. I see real estate as literally connect the dots game. Right. And I always give them this example. I've, I worked with this elderly lady who was a tear down on a half an acre lot in Tarzana. And I present her with an offer right away. She wasn't ready. It took them about a year to get back to me to tell me that now they're ready to sell. That developer is gone and he doesn't exist. And a lot of developers shied away from, you know, purchasing in that pocket, even though it was a great lot, because uh, not a lot of new constructions are, are in that pocket. So I couldn't find anyone to buy it and they were ready to sell. So I, I, I went to the house to visit them. While I was there, I said, you know what? I'm going to drive around the neighborhood and see if there's another new construction or something being built. So I started driving around and I saw a house, beautiful, modern being built. I pulled up, went outside and I went into the, into the property. It's under construction. Um, and I saw the builder there and I started chatting. I'm like, hey, you're, you're the builder? He's like, yeah. I'm like, are you selling this? He's like, no, I'm actually building it for my, my kid, my son. I'm like, that's awesome. I'm like, you live in the neighborhood? He's like, yeah, I live here. I own another property here. I said, that's great. I'm like, I have a lot, 22,000 square feet down the street. Are you interested? He said, I'm always interested. And he's like, can I come with you right now? Got him in my car, drove down to the lot, showed it to him. He said, can I come back with my wife in a couple of hours? I said, sure. Went back with his wife, showed it to his wife, and they loved it. Wrote an all cash offer, closed in 15 days. He built it. I came back and sold it. I worked with his kid to purchase another property, another kid. And it just became this. Great, great transaction, right? But I literally, all I did is, you know, I told him, I said, you could go into any neighborhood that has construction and new development, find a teardown, drive around, find another builder. Most probably one of the two, three, four builders in that pocket will buy it. That's the quickest way you could make money in real estate. <laughs> Super simple. And when you get that, now leverage that listing to go and door knock everyone else in the area and call them and say, hey, we just sold this. 
off market, you know, we have to have whatever that script is to help you get more business. But this business could be so easy if you just do the steps, prospect, call, knock, get the inventory. In this market right now, inventory is thin. Mm -hmm. We need to create the inventory. How do you do that? So we farm, right? We farm all of Encino, Sherman Oaks, Calabasas. And now we get all these calls like, hey, I want to sell, but not now, in a year or six months. So we keep a tab off markets. We have this list. So anytime we have a listing, a buyer walks in, I'm not ready now, but I'll buy in six months. I'll have a great property for you in six months. This is what we have. Here are the specs. Oh, that, that sounds great. Now, not only you have that buyer, you told them that you have something that no one has access to. You're also going to send them what's on the market. And then whenever they're ready, if they like that house, they could buy it. If they don't like that house, they're going to work with you because you have access to off markets. You know the area, you sell in the area, you know the community and the schools, and there's no one better that's no one better than you for them to work with. Um, so I, I call it connect the dots for expires or cancels or you know off markets or builders, because that's that's really what we need to do is that's why I tell them go check out the inventory. Go to Brokers Opens, uh, door knock, meet people, right? Now, you know what's selling, what's not selling. Why isn't that one selling? Why did this one sell and break a price per foot? Who was the builder for this? Who bought it? What kind of celebrity bought this, right? And why did they buy in here? What was so special about this house? Because um, there's a reason why some homes sell quickly, some homes break price per foot, and some homes sit on the market. There's a reason for all these things. And you have to explain this. And when you're sitting in front of a seller and you tell them, oh yeah, that home was built by Rob Diaz and he does one of a kind homes. Every home that he does is different than any of the other ones. And that's why he breaks the price per foot in all the neighborhoods and he sells most of them off market. And this home sold off market to a Dodger player. And when, as soon as you give them this information, you already, you, you already got that listing. You just gave them so much value you know more than most probably the other agents that he's interviewing. And just by you telling him his neighbor's house sold off market and he didn't know that, that's it. It's done, right? Uh, your, your, your value, your knowledge, you know, if everything else could literally throw it down the trash, but the value and the knowledge and the connection, most importantly, uh, is what will help you secure that listing. So, you know, waking up, uh, having your your goals and dressing properly, uh, showing up professional, speaking professionally. You know, when a seller tells you something, repeat it the way that he said it. Uh, remember what they said. You know, now we involve our sellers in literally every property description and having them review the photos with us. It it makes them engage in the process. Like we're working on this together. We're a team. Can you, you know, is there anything that I left out in the description that you'd like to include? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd love to add, you know, that we, uh, you know, we put this Zia tile, backslash tile, or whatever it was, a finish or something. When they get involved in the process, they feel like they're part of the process. And, you know, a lot of agents go take the photos, write the description, and list the property, and the, you know, seller sees it and they're like, well, shit, I, I don't like that description. You should take that photo down. Um, you, you've lost. <laughs> um, and, you know, th these are all things that a lot of solo agents are not able of doing because you can't handle five listings, five coming soons, buyer showings, and review these things with your, uh, with your sellers. You can't do that unless you have admins, support, marketing people, um, that will help you provide that that service, that white glove service. See, I, I want to talk about that. I want to flip that a little bit though, because even the be a lot of what you speak of, right? As we see, okay, it's door knocking, it's cold calling, it's knowing what you're speaking of, educating yourself on the market, right. on the properties, on the solds. The information is all readily available for all the agents, and the fact right. of the matter is that. 87% and 87% of all agents fail within four years. And what do you see? Like, and I know what I see the biggest problem is it's just like people aren't willing to do the fucking work. They don't want to, they don't want to pick up the phone call. Like I, I remember I was running a training a couple of weeks ago and we ha I had a newer agent ask me, Hey, you know, I feel like I'm X amount of months, six months in the business. And, uh, you know, I felt like I would have my niche 
already and I don't have my niche. And I'm like, shit, there's people that are like 15 years in the business that don't people have their niche. niche. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, people don't have niches after 25 years in the business. Who knows what you're, but, uh, and you I asked the question, the wheel. I, I just asked the simple, I was like, okay, let's go back. Because it, instead of looking at the deals you're doing, look at the actions that you're making. How many calls did you make in the last week? None. How many social media posts? Oh, I uh, posted a few stories. Okay, great. But you made no great. calls. You made no you had zero real estate conversations. You didn't do any door knocking. You didn't do any cold calling. You didn't call your sphere of influence. Lazy, like they're, lazy. <laughs> they're waiting for someone to call them. They're waiting for their freaking phone to ring. And someone says, hey, so-and-so, can you come and list my house? Can you bring the agreement with you? That's not going to happen. I, I got the funniest <laughs> thing. So I called one of my clients who invested with me a year and a half ago. Uh, 1.6-ish uh, property, about an hour north of Toronto. And I call her a couple months before closing. And I usually call every couple months just to check in, see how she's doing. And I could do a better job. I want to put this out there. I'm no fucking guru in this. I, <laughs> I, I've i fallen you off. I'm drastically inconsistent with a lot of stuff. But I call her up and I want to share this because it's so important. And I say, hey, how's it going? You're closing in a couple months. Is there anything you need, anything you have in mind? Uh, you've had your color chart appointment, this, that, just touch, touching base, small talk. And yeah. no, I'm good. I'm like, and then in the end, I was like, hey, before I get off the phone, is there any other real estate needs that you have that I could help you out with? She's like, actually, I need to sell my house. And I'm like, oh but she God. didn't think of, and this also shows something to me is she didn't think of calling me to sell her house. And if I didn't ask the question, well, A, I, I, if I didn't ask the question, I wouldn't have gotten her at all. She would have hired someone else. And then B, it shows me I can do a better job of calling these people and position, positioning myself as not only an agent for the investors, but an agent for the sellers. And exactly. how do I need to reposition myself to do that? But long story short, took four weeks to get her house ready, got it painted, replaced the carpet with floors. Like, And I told her, I'm like, here's the number, yeah. 122 to 13 is where I think this is valued. And we had an offer date. The offer date was the day of the rate hike. So it's just as bad, <laughs> like fuck. Like, so the day of the rate That's hike. That's all the off rates, rates, rates are going up. up. <laughs> and we had it listed about 150K below ask. We get one offer on offer date and you know it's oh. a hit or a miss. And Shit. it's like, it's a good like 70K away from where it needs to be and it has two conditions in there. It has an inspection because of the basement and it's a retrofit entrance and it has another one uh, financing. And I'm at this for like seven hours negotiating oh, back yeah, and yeah, forth, yeah. back and forth. But at 1 a.m., finally, I got them to take out the conditions, <laughs> bring their offer up 70 grand to 122 and a firm deal. And the deposit came you in the next day. Up. But fuck, man. Like, but people don't, re people also don't realize the power of negotiation and they want to hire there. And we have this. Um, slight bit where sure 25% of agents do actually 70, 75% of the business. That's the reality. But there's so many of these people that hire their cousin or their aunt, yeah, their uncle that, that does work cousin. in real estate. But if, if that was a cousin, that client just lost $70,000. 70 grand. But and oh, but they would have paid 1% commission and they would have been happy, right? But exactly. that 1% commission is what? 12 grand that you saved or 18 grand? That's but it costs you seven. Mind boggling. Like if, Mind -boggling. if someone doesn't understand, like, I don't care how many offers, whether there's one or seven, I'm negotiating the shit out of this one deal and here's, milking here's it for down. every penny I can get. And it Absolutely. sold at where it should have sold regardless, like and, where I said the value was. And ideally it should sell close to that. And you as an agent should be educated enough to give them that. My client said right. to me, I want one, one, three. I'm like, shit. I'm like, I'll do my best. Well, well, but at this the is end what of the we day, need to do to get you to that number. And you gave him those steps. Yeah. Right? And, and we and did everything uh, we could to maximize value. So it, right. Right. And they listen. And I love it when sellers listen. And when they pay you your full commission, you do the job with passion. Yeah. Right. And you do everything in your power to get them the best results and negotiate and really go out of your way and day and night and you know work until 1 a.m to get what your client really wanted we just recently turned down a big listing in hidden hills four million dollar listing because the seller didn't want to pay you know a uh, commission that we asked for and we honed in on our 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 values what we do who we are our sales our team 
it just didn't matter for this client. And I was, it came to us through another team member in our team. And I just told uh, our team member, Oh, I said, you know what? Sometimes it's just not worth it. If a client like this, that doesn't see our value and just is solely focused on paying the lowest commission possible. We don't want that. I don't want to work with that client mm -hmm. really, because that's, that's a client that you're already starting your process on the wrong foot. You're, you're one getting paid the least amount. She wants a little bit more than what the property is worth. They don't want to do the work. And it, it, I'm not going to be able to get you the results. And I'm going to look like a terrible agent. You're going to cancel the listing on me. You're going to go relist with someone else. And they're going to sell it quickly. And now you're going to do the work. I'd rather be that second agent. <laughs> right? You know, let's, let's see how that works with that Redfin agent. And when that doesn't work out, call me back. Do what we told you to do, clean up the house and, you know, do these steps because you're going to get a lot more, a lot more than what you thought you're going to get. You're going to sell your home faster. You're going to sell it for more money. And that commission that you're negotiating, that one half, one and a half percent, whatever you're trying to save, that's minimal next to the amount of uh, money that you would lose if you don't do what that season agent told you. So it's, it's really invaluable. Some sellers, unfortunately, don't see that. And, you know, when, when you start, when you get to a higher level, I'm not going to say you start picking and choosing who you want to work with, but you're at a point where you can say no to someone that you don't think that's going to be a good fit. Or if it's overpriced and they don't want to pay your commissions and they don't want to do any work to it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay to say, no, I don't need that in my life right now. Um, I have, that aren't motivated. There are people that are waiting. <laughs> yeah, that, that pe there's people out there that aren't motivated. I remember we we went out yeah. for a listing presentation. We uh, door knocked this house and he had it listed for six something, then five eight, then five 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 four, and it was worth like four six four eight at best. It's it's a tear down. Um, but yeah. he thinks he's like, you know, they would need to pay me six million dollars and kiss my hand for the, <laughs> to take it. And I'm like, fuck, man. It's like, the best lot in to, town. To, uh, yeah, it spent two hours with this yeah. guy, too. And uh, it is what it is. Sometimes it's just not. Yeah. No, we're not listing it for six and a half. It's just not like it's worth four something high, high fours. If you're, you're way off. Yeah, we're not. Yeah. It doesn't it make it time, sense. your time, your energy, money, marketing. Um, it just does not make sense. Uh, but I'll be it, honest, I'm not quite there where you are. So I try not to refuse listings. But if it's that like ridiculous, I will. Well, look, but I know my value. I also don't rare. take shit on at 1% or 0.5 or 1.5. I won't do it. Oh, I think my Siri kicked in. Oh. It's really rare for us to not take a listing. And that doesn't happen. This happened recently. And I can't remember the last time that something like this happened where I, there's once in my life, I fired a seller. That was once in my life. And that was a condo and it was an expired listing. I came in because I sold another condo in the building and I told them what to do. I said, paint stage, let's listen at this price. We'll get multiples and we'll hit this number or higher. That exactly happened. This lady, about five, six months later, she listed with someone else at a high price, terrible photos, not painted, not staged, sat on the market, uh, reduced the price, didn't sell, canceled. She called me. She said, whatever you did with that property, I want you to do with this property. Great. Well, this is what you need to do. And this was her number, her reduced price. And she said, give me this number. I'll sell it. She painted, staged, list, underlisted. Um, the, the condo got multiple offers, got an offer at the price that she wanted. She said, now she wants $40,000 more. And the market already told us we're not there because we've had multiple offers. I drove it up as high as I can. And these guys, they're not going to go up another $40,000. We went back and forth and, you know, I, she was telling me that it's a retrograde and Mercury is not aligned with I don't know who. And as soon as she said that, I said, oh, wow, this, this is, is not <laughs> someone I want to work with. <laughs> this is she's like, don't worry, another buyer will come. Let's cancel. And let's continue marketing the property. And I said, I'm sorry, but I have not. I've never done this before in my life. But 
here is the cancellation for the listing. I don't want anything for it. I'll cover, you know, the cost that we incurred. I'm going to cover that. I just, you know, I'm, I'm done. I've, I've done my job. I got you offers. I've got you the number that you want, something that your previous agent didn't do, and you still don't want to take it. And she's like, please, please, I think we could really do this. And I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm done. And I just did not, you know, long text messages from her explaining why. And I don't know what. And I said, this is not what I what I want to, this is not a person I want to work with. Uh, I canceled that listing. She relisted with someone else and sat on the market and ended up selling it for about thirty dollars or $40,000 less than what I got. Less, yeah. So, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That, that yeah, is what I would have anticipated because when you have that bidding war, and you've got the scenario and you're able to play off a few offers, that's usually the best that you're going to get. And I, yeah. uh, same thing, like in the middle of the pandemic, I had a listing, it was a semi-detached in Vaughn, listed for, I think, $7.99 uh, or $7.99, yeah. And we get our, and I told them the value of this home after doing the rentals, we spent about 10, 15K on the 15K total, uh, redid the entire kitchen, but repainted the house it was yellow walls i'm like fuck who's gonna buy this let's repaint everything the trim Red like car stage car. it <laughs> let's but right i want to put as much money in the seller's pocket as possible that's the goal um it's not anything else we're not doing it for our own personal benefit it's for your personal benefit you get to keep the extra 40 50 grand you get faster <laughs> for the most amount of money People are going to be happy. You're not exactly. going to have issues, avoiding lawsuits. So we get our right? first offer in and our first offer, and these guys wanted 980. That was the number. That was their number. First offer so comes nine, in. Nine, nine, eight, eight. And 980 okay. is what they want. First offer comes in. I have a million dollars on the board. And oh, I'm like, great start. And, uh, and this is preemptive. So it's not even offer date yet. So I'm like, we're changing offer dates, the offer dates tonight. We've already had like 35 showings. We got another 10 in a couple of days. I'm like, we're, or 25 or 35, something like that. I'm like, we're changing offer dates, offer dates tonight. So I pick up the phone right. call every fucking agent that's had. And, but this is like four hours of sweat equity now, but people don't see this behind the scenes. So right. every agent, every agent come in tonight. If you guys want, this is it. We're submit, gonna, submit, we're submit. gonna sell the house tonight. So come in with your best offer. I get a million twenty on the board, uh, and nice. now we're talking. And then I'm uh, sitting with the sellers. I get a million forty on the board. Uh, I got one of them <laughs> to move up, and I'm like, and then that was the top offer. And these guys are what is it going to take for us to get the house? <laughs> these, these guys are contemplating not taking the offer. They're like, should we wait till offer date? Oh. And I'm like, guys, like the property's the not worth. Like in. we've already gotten you like a good five percent over what the market values the property at because there's just a frenzy right now i will do what i can i got that person to move from 1040 i got the highest bidder to go up to 1052 oh actually God, like this God. is a fact like and i did have other offers they weren't can you get us 1.1 now and no, i'm like and that was the number and i'm like guys if you guys don't accept this this is just they did end up accepting we sold the house good. they were happy it worked good. out but it was a good seventy two thousand more than they wanted but once again you go Amazing. with your average agent and you get the million dollar offer, guys. We should accept this. And then He's we'll do, do the sweat and equity and call for it. it. was four hours of phone conversations. I had to clear my schedule. I had dinner. I remember I had dinner that night scheduled with a bunch of uh, clubhouse folks. I remember this to the day. Because then in the end, at like 1045, once the deal was done, firm, I went out for dinner till at like celebrate. 11. And I, I went go. out to celebrate. But our dinner was at 8. And I'm like, fuck this. I got it. You got to do what you got to do. I got work to do. I got work. I got to sell houses. Exactly. <laughs> That's the joke. So like another Joe Schmo agent would be like, ah, it's 435. I'm going to leave. We got one offer here, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. Here's our offer. You know, and there is no, you know, there's no urgency and fire. And like, let's, let's sell this house today. Let me call everyone in town and let them know that offers are due today. They're not doing these things, going out of their way to, one, satisfy the seller, get them the most amount of money and just do a really, really good job. You know, we're talking about this earlier. Most agents are just lazy and I don't know why, um, you know, and we see this in our team. We have great team members. There's other team members that close a couple of big transactions and then they take three, four weeks off. And I said, why, why are you taking time off? 
I close a seven, eight, 10, $15 million deal. I'm in the office the next day. I'm working. I'm in the office that day, the closing day, you know, and I'm, I'm working and building a pipeline because now more than ever, when inventory is thin and you're seeing a lot of agents exiting the business mm -hmm. and the bigger agents are taking bigger market share, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to put transactions together. So you just need to do more. If you were doing 20, 30 contacts a day before, now you got to do 60 contacts a day to get the same results as before. If you're mailing a thousand homes, now you got to mail 5,000 homes to get the same results. Everything that you were doing before, you got to do double, triple, quadruple to get the same amount of results. And, you know, we're sitting on a big amount of inventory right now uh, of, of listings and some move quickly. We have multiple offers and some and some some others sit and it's taking longer to sell. And you could never rely on like one transaction because it's just that one transaction. Million things could go wrong and it falls out. So you got to have a pipeline of escrows, of listings, of buyers, builders to really survive and be successful in this business. Uh, and the only way to do that is to stay consistent. And these guys don't stay consistent. They're not there early. They're not showing up every day. They're not talking to enough people. And most importantly, they're not working on themselves, right? They're not working on their skills. A lot of people get into this business. And they're out there, they're talking, they're selling, they're doing this. And, you know, there's a lot of agents that do the work. They do the open houses, they do the door knocking and call calling, but there is no conversion. So what's the problem? Well, there is uh, maybe a, a tonality problem, scripts problem, conversion. You're not saying the right things. You're not asking the right questions. You're not presenting yourself well to get the client in front of you to believe that you are the authority, you are the realtor that could sell their house, you know the area more than anyone else, and there's a conversion issue. So what do you do? You have to work on your skills. That's another thing that I fell in love with this business because it's not just a business for, you know, a sales business. It's a business where like you have to really work on yourself. Uh, my tonality, the questions that I need to ask, how do I ask them, objection handlers, and these are skills that you could use in everything in life, in your <laughs> relationship with your kids, uh, with your team. It makes you a better leader. Uh, that's another thing that I really, really love about this business because like it's, it teaches you everything in life, right? To be a better person, a better father, a better brother. Um, how to, how to uh, you know, if you're a really good salesman, you can walk into a dealership and negotiate a really good uh, price for your car. Or else you're just walking in there and the guy literally will sell the shit out of you. Car salesmen are really good salesmen. Uh, we have one on the team. He used to be a car salesman, a really successful one. Now he's selling real estate and he's really, really good. Uh, so like that's, that's you know, something that I, I, I fell in love with in real estate in general because you're always learning, you're always improving. Uh, and I want to go back to having my team, joining the agency, Gina's in Calabasas. I'm out of Studio City. And being, being a partner with someone is probably a really, really difficult decision. If you don't have a trust uh, foundation, um, you know, comfort level. So, like, it made it really easy for both of us to combine our teams into one because we've known each other for such a long time best friends, you know, now, you know, and then my wife got in the picture and we became really close friends. We traveled the world and, you know, that made it really easy for us to just combine our teams together and be one big team to like start dominating the, our, our, our neighborhoods, our, our areas. Cause now you have a, a $40 million agent and another $40 million agent combining. Now we're $80 million agents together. We could grow this to be four, five, six hundred million dollar agents, right? Um, and that was that was a decision that we made um, in 2018, 19, and was one of the best decisions that we both made. And again, that trust factor had a lot to do with it. Uh, and we've never went out of our way to go and, you know, recruit and bring more agents to the team. That was never our intention. We wanted 
a small team. Everyone that was on my team was people that I've known. They came to me and said, hey, you know, can I, can I join your team? And I said, sure, let's start mentoring and this and that and, you know, open houses. And they stuck with me. And that same thing with her. And then we combine our teams and we still tell today haven't went out of our way to recruit. If anything, it's a referral by another agent and a business manager or someone that says, hey, you know, this is a great agent. I think you'll be a really good fit. We'll meet them and they'll join our team. How now many agents do you have, George? You and Gina? I think uh, we have four admins mm-hmm. and we have 14 or 15 agents okay. on our team right, right now. Uh, we're doing, you know, we're, we're, we're about 150, 160 million in volume so far this just year to date. Uh, We did 230 to 240 million last year with 150 transactions. We're one of the teams in the agency here in LA that does probably the most units. Um, It's good and bad. It's a lot of headache. 150 units is a lot of headache. (laughs) And then I look at like Santiago, you got like 30 transactions for 400 million. Yeah, like, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tra- yeah, yeah. Even Zach, it's Zach did like crazy. Zach did like 15 transactions for like 100 it's, million. It's crazy, 100 something right? million. You know, that was a that was another changing moment in in my career where I was, you know, I didn't have the fours and the fives and the 10 millions and these new constructions that uh we're selling now. We we've had lower end and we're doing a lot more units. And when I came here and started seeing what are these bigger agents are doing, they're, you know, they're, they're doing same amount of work that I'm doing, but less in units, same amount of volume. And it started triggering something with me that how do I increase my average sales price? And coming from where I come from, where, you know, and Santiago, same thing, and he's been in the business a lot longer than me, to be where he's at now, um, I didn't have, neither Gina kind of has a similar background, didn't have the contacts, a business manager that would send me a celebrity client that wants to buy a $10 million home. So the only way for us to get there is, you know, networking, trying to build these relationships, but more importantly, something that we I personally got into heavily to increase my average price per foot or average uh, sales price is builder business. So I said, all right, so if I don't know anyone in Palisades or Brentwood um, or Hidden Hills, if I don't know anyone here that wants to sell in the 10, 15, 20 million range, how do I find a teardown for a builder that they could buy for three or four or five million that could be turned into a 15, 20 million? So that became my focus. And I just started going really heavily in prospecting for my builders and my investors to get them these, you know, older homes, small homes on big lots, the large lots we could develop on. And about 70% of our business became that. Now we have a pipeline for the next two, three years of homes that are going to come on the market. It's the best way for you to, as an agent, to build a pipeline. Because when you deal with a buyer or seller, you sell them a house, you go into the database and, you know, three, four, five, six years later, they might sell, they, you know, they might refer you business, which is great. But with builder business, you have a transaction now that most, most of the time you'll double end. And then in a year and a half, two years, depending on where it is and how long it's going to take, you know, you have a seven, a 10, a 15, a 20, a 40 million coming up. Um, this gorgeous, stunning new construction. And you're going to take that and leverage it. And you're going to go out to everyone else in that area and say, I got this listing and throw that twilight party, invite all the freaking neighbors, go door knock them and talk to them and invite them over and show them the property and build that network of others in the area that own 20, 30, 40 million dollars. And that was the, the, the thing that I focused on in order for me to meet people in that room, that, that, that wealth, um, uh, that changed my career. Uh, cause it's, it's tough. It took me about, you know, 2013, 14, I'm going to say six, seven years to start getting to luxury and selling these higher end homes. Uh, John Groman says this really well. Success is a 
marathon. It's not a sprint. A lot of agents that I know get into the business and they're like, I want to go to Beverly Hills. I want to sell 30, 40, 50 million dollar homes. Well, that's great. I hope you could accomplish that and you got your license two months ago. Most probably not, but I hope you do. I never discourage anyone. If someone told me I want to go to Beverly Hills and you know I want to get a listing there, I said, hell yeah, let's go do it, right? Let's go because like I never want to discourage anyone. I'm the most positive person you could ever meet. Uh, I'm all, you know, rarely people see me mad. I'm always having my smile on and I'm positive, encouraging everyone. So like, I'm not going to tell you that might not work, but you're going to need to put in a lot of work to get to that point. People want to work with athletes and Laker players and baseball players and Rams players like uh, Jordan Cohen. Jordan Cohen didn't start selling homes to celebrities and athletes. He started selling homes in Canoga Park. <laughs> he sold his first one to his uh, to his in-laws, his girlfriend's I parents. His, I, yeah. I haven't finished the book, but I am reading it. I promise you, Jordan, I'm going to finish it soon. <laughs> it, it's fantastic. <laughs> He's great, by the way. I've had some great He's people. Awesome. And then you speak of athletes. We had uh, Holly Meyer Lucas from South Florida. She runs the nice. Meyer Lucas team, and uh, she's married to someone who was in the MLB. She's got a massive book of celebrity clients as well. Even Zar, our own Zar Zingane, he's a beast. Like just his, uh, his role of Dexter. Listen to his story about Michael Jackson. That was really. Did you watch the podcast? Really, I did. Okay. I did. Okay. Yeah. Of course. That, and that, that was, was really I think, cool. the first time he goes through the entire story. And I think I yeah, urge people to was, just go really, like really, really cool. such and, uh, a the whole like. Uh, how to, uh, the, the guy with the truck that uh, was a celebrity client that had a truck. Yeah, yeah, uh, the big really, old truck. Really good. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, man. <laughs> that, you, you never know. You know, I've learned that at the bank where people walk in and you look at them and you say, mm, I don't know. And you'll sit down, I'll tell you to pull up their accounts and you see millions of dollars there. Like, shit. So, you know, you can never judge. You just don't know who's in front of you and who they know. Uh, I've had clients come to freaking homes and they, they did not look like a buyer in general. And they would sit down and they would look around. And, you know, after about 10 minutes, and I'm really good at like getting a vibe uh, of, 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 of someone. I, I'm like, you know, I, I had a team member next to me. It was about a two, two and a half million dollar house. I said, I think, I think that's a cash buyer. And that same day, that guy walked out of the house, called his agent. His agent called me back. Say my client just walked out of the house. He's all cash. What is it going to take? <laughs> it, you know, this guy did not look like he has <laughs> any cash. <laughs> he looked like he needed new uh, clothes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So like you, just, you never judge. You're at an open house. Put your smile on. Be professional. Treat everyone the same way because you don't know who you're meeting. We've had another really interesting story. Is we've had a client. So... There's a listing on the market in Calabasas and we're showing the listing to a client of ours, the seller. Oh, let me, let me take this back. The listing agent couldn't make it and the seller lived in the house. We brought the client in, uh, Gina specifically, my partner walked the house with the client. The seller got so impressed, right? Didn't say anything at the time. The listing expired. First call we got, hey, really like you, really love the way that you handled, you know, that, that showing and, you know, like they just, they couldn't sell it. I don't want you guys to list it. So like, that's, that's another way of you. Like some people think, oh my God, the seller is going to be there. And, ah, uh, I don't know what to do here. I don't know if I should go or, or, or even as a listing agent, you should always show up. Always show up. You have to do the fucking showing. You got to be there. You can't send another agent while your seller is there because anything can happen. If it's a vacant home, it's a different story. But if the seller is there, you got to be there, right? That's your reputation. You, your job is to go show the house. Now the seller feels like they have to show the house and they're going to answer the questions. And they might say something that triggers that buyer to not buy that house. Anything can happen. Right. So like that's a, that's another interesting story. I would, I would highly recommend any listing agent to show your homes or have someone from the team be there at the showing to facilitate that, that, that showing and make sure all questions are answered. And the seller is sitting in their office away from what's happening. 
so it's funny today when we got there, he's like, you know, and he said he wanted to be present for uh, the showing. He's the builder as well. He's the homeowner and the builder. And when we got there, he's like, you know, I'll walk you guys through, but I'll, uh, you guys can talk about like the beauty and the craftsmanship and I'll tell them all the details. I, and I told him before we started, I was like, don't worry. I was like, go through everything. Let me take some notes. And I took notes and what that does it it just helps reiterate it because you're repeating it as you're writing it down so that helped me remember everything he said and dude the, the house was 9177 square feet so like to to the t i'm like backing onto the lake this that like every number 90 by 136 like having that what brand what's this what stone um there's stone like everything <laughs> everything down to the cabinet company remembered it all and it it's just great to have that opportunity to do it instead i could have let him take the lead but then he would have never seen what we're potentially capable of and this is someone who's been building houses for 20 years and he's building another one down the street so you just never know what comes up and i know i have one tomorrow so i'm like we're gonna do the same thing tomorrow where a seller can tag along not a problem and they can add to anything but we'll of, do a walkthrough and another thing like you know we i've had a mortgage background my family's been in construction for 25 years uh i knew about construction uh we you know later on as we started getting more successful we started buying homes, we flipped homes, we built and sold homes, uh, we buy and hold, we built, you know, ADU, second units now, uh, we built a portfolio of, of rental properties, and it puts us in a, in a position where when I talk to an investor or a buyer or a seller that wants to build, remodel, or uh, buy investment properties, multi-units, it puts me in a, one, the one thing is, is if you don't, if you don't have that, if you don't have multi-units and rental properties and construction background, make it your, your job to go and learn more about that. Go to construction sites and walk through with the builder. And even if they're going to list with someone else, say, hey, Mr. Builder, I'm, I'm a newer agent in this area. I'm looking to build relationships. Are you looking for another teardown? Absolutely. They're always looking for teardowns, right? Fantastic. Would you mind walking me through this property just to show me what you're doing here? And uh, that way I could give this information back to my office and maybe get a buyer for it. And now you're establishing a value. You're building a relationship with a builder that if you find another teardown, he'll buy it. And he's going to take you through the property and he's going to tell you everything about it. That information that you're going to get in the knowledge, you could use for, you know, while meeting other builders. Yeah, you know, the build, another builder meets you and, you know, now you have information that you didn't know before. Oh yeah, yeah, I love these countertops. They're quartzite or they're quartz or, you know, Taj Mahal, whatever it is, or these cabinets, oh, these are fantastic. They're from Italy. I just saw one the other day in the other, uh, the other community. So like agents need to make time to learn more about construction window types, roof types, uh, review inspections reports. I know agents that have been in the business for a while that till, to, till today, they have not read a lot of the purchase agreement or till today don't own property. How do you go as a realtor for fucking 20 years and don't own investment properties, right? Like, that boggles my you... mind. I'm like the first thing I, I got money coming in. I'm not, property. I'm not buying a, I'm not buying a car and I'm, I'm buying a fucking rental property. I'm buying something that's going to grow. That's just me. Right. <laughs> I, I think at a point in time you can get to that where the first thing shouldn't be the Porsche that you want to buy. And it's funny because I, I remember a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. And you know how our business is where you get chunks of change at one time. So I'm seeing this big chunk of change in my account. And I'm like, what do I do? I wanted, I wanted a Porsche Panamera GTS. So I'm like, <laughs> fuck. I'm like, my brother. So my brother's what telling me to buy, my brother's telling me to buy it. He's like, buy it. Just do it. Um, you deserve it. You've worked hard. Dude. And I'm like, yo. Mm. So I turned around. <laughs> I swear. I turned around and I ended up buying two investment properties instead. And I'm like, let's just see. Right. And, you know, knock on wood, they're both up multiple six figures today two That's years awesome. later and at the peak they were up way more even with 
the market dropping, they're doing well. I just closed on one a couple months ago, closed on one last month. The second one I'm actually setting up to be an Airbnb uh, because like, well, when we calculated mortgages at 3% versus six now, <laughs> well, they went up like 80% in mortgage payments. Yeah. Uh, well, two versus six. So I it, need this cash flow. Uh, yeah, we're going to Airbnb it. It's a, but that's the thing, right? But now I have content and I'll be able to teach people right. how to do that. It's my second Airbnb property that I'm doing. The other one's a long-term tenancy, but it, it goes back to your point. How do you utilize the information that you have to share with people? You don't, and it's not, stopping you and i believe this wholeheartedly even when you got in the business not many people would have asked you how long you've been in the business because you sounded like you knew what you were speaking of you could right. relay information well and selling selling the commodity is the only thing that changes it was loans back then it's houses today Knowledge. right but people right. need to spend the time right instead of scrolling on fucking instagram for four hours Get off your Figure phone, out what their get next on the MLS, <laughs> go learn it, go walk properties. Even if you have right. to do it alone, just take videos and start understanding how things are presented. Go watch that Inez guy on, um, on YouTube. Well, on YouTube. Go, yeah. watch, the go, watch, and the go watch your top lanes. Yeah. Finishes, right? It's an he art. He does a really good job. It, it is, is an, an art. art. It, it is an art. art. And if you speak the way he speaks um, and show, showing a home the way that he does in his videos, you'll be one of the most successful agents, right? Um, and then, you know, another thing a lot of people focus on is, hey, you know, I want to make money. I want to I want to buy a house. I want to buy a house for me and my family. Well, like, if you read any freaking book, like Grant Cardone, 10X Rule, or Rich and Poor Dad, that's not the first thing you should be doing. Don't buy your own house the, for, as a first investment, because as soon as you buy that, what are you going to do? Now you're going to have to make money to make your mortgage payments. Mm -hmm. You're making money to make your mortgage payments. And it's a liability. So like something like, again, it's just reading. There's, you do not need to reinvent this wheel. You just got to see what others are doing, read it, implement it. So, you know, hey, what you should be doing is buying investment property. Why? Well, you're going to rent it out. Someone else is going to pay for it. You could save money to buy another one. Then when you do that, now you're going to have enough cash flow. So when you buy your own, someone is going to pay half of that mortgage mm -hmm. or maybe sometimes all of it. So like you, you just go and do that. So we did exactly that. We bought one, we bought two. Then that two, you know, was a bigger lot. So we put a second unit on there and became three. And then I went and bought my own property, right? And I, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in creating value. So I'm not going to go buy a new construction, even though it was a year and a half of freaking hell, tearing down and rebuilding our house <laughs> while my wife was pregnant. And, you know, the entire, uh, uh, it was COVID time and entire market, and we had the busiest time of our life. Uh, but we took that property, we increased the value tremendously. I got to refinance it, cashed out all my money, and took that money and invested in something else, right? In another property. And we're doing the same thing again. It's not rocket science. Mm -mm. You, you buy it, you rehab it, you could put another unit on there, like here in LA, ADUs. Now you have two units on the lot and you refinance that one, cash it out, rent both. They're paying your mortgage and your cash flowing. Just go do it again. It's really simple. A it's lot a, of people are doing this. It's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a long game. Hold your properties long term. Canada and the U.S. across the board, every 10 years, our market, well, our market has pretty much doubled almost every 10 years. Our 45-year average is you, You've been 7%. like this for a, for a long time. Yeah. I don't think you guys have. So really we did. didn't. So even that 2009 crash, and uh, Holly asked me about this, uh, and I said to her, I'm like, we didn't really feel it. We went down maybe like 10%. We didn't go down 50, 60%. And I remember when I was in, I was in the States for a wedding, like 2013, 14, 14 maybe, and someone said, oh, you guys are going to crash. You guys are going to crash, sell your real estate, sell you. And it just did one of these. And if you had listened to that, oh. where would you be, right? Like, and a lot of people who try to time the market end up missing out versus put time in the market, buy it. Right. And even if you bought, I believe, last year at the peak, our peak was March. We went down 23% from the peak to the bottom. And then we went up. We rode up 12% month over month. Almost 14, actually. 14% month over month between Feb and June this year, which is wild. Like, Well, a lot, of, a lot of people compare now to last year 
But last year was an anomaly, right? Mm -hmm. so we were talking about this with Billy Rose and you know several other agents, and you can't compare the market now to last year, even a seller or a buyer. Last year was the anomaly. Something happened that no one thought was going to happen, right? So you got to go back, not even 2021. You got to go back to like 2019 to really compare and say, that's, that's a normal market. Where are we at? So when we did that comparison, we were down about 20%, like you said, here mm -hmm. in LA. Uh, Billy Rose came up with these numbers and you know that's, that's not bad. We as a team, we're actually doing better in volume this year versus last year. So, you know, that you can't, you can't compare. There's a lot of agents, bigger teams that are doing as well as last year, if not better. Right. And that's, you know, that's, that's experience that's taking over market share, uh, taking over market share. That's, uh, a lot of agents going out of the business and just not doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a really good market. We're in still, we're still seeing multiples inventories low. Yeah. Rates are all time high, but I had a client the other day that was grateful. They got seven and a half percent. All the rates that they got from everyone else were, you know, eight, eight and a quarter. And, you know, they bought a, a one and a half million dollar house and their payment was, you know, when I looked at their payment, it's crazy. Right. But, they were pregnant, they were having another baby and they needed a house. They're in a small, tiny home. So, and then we have a new construction for $4 million that we got a 20 year old singer to buy it. And the other buyer in line was a 22 year old actress. Um, so, you know, you got, you're in LA or Canada where you have so much diversity, buyers, sellers, life events happening. We're, we're gonna be doing great. It's only gonna get better. Rates will come down and the market is going to get better. Prices will, you know, stay where they're at right now. I don't think they're going to dip. I think if anything, next year, whenever rates start coming down, this market is going to start skyrocketing back. up. I'm 100% with you. I think, I think it's stability right now. And think of it like this, right? The flip side is if those properties were 20% more expensive a year and a half ago, well, you're saving 300 grand on that. $1.5 million property, right? So it was, it would have been 1.8. Would you have rather paid 3% at 1.8 or pay what you pay now? You save 300 K sure. You're paying more. You're paying more for the mortgage at one five at today's rate than you would have been at one eight at oh. yesterday's rate. But in the long run, you're going to build that down, equity. It's going to come. Exactly. You, you bring your, your payment down. Uh, so that's, you know, the, 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 that's the beauty about, about real estate and again like going back there's nothing i would change about my journey i loved the journey uh how you know everything happened throughout the life and the people you meet and they take you in different directions and you know you are the the, the, the average of the five people that you surround yourself with uh your vibe attracts your tribe baby your that's vibe it. attracts that's your that. I, tribe I, I, you know, I i believe in that not just here, we're traveling and we met some of the coolest people and why, you know, good energy attracts good energy. That's as simple as that, right? We always meet amazing people when we're traveling. When we're here, we go out, we're surrounded with amazing people, great energy, right? And you figure out who are those people that you need to be surrounded with. Where is that company that I need to go to, to be surrounded with those people to help you elevate in, uh, in life in all aspects of life. And if you take the time, a lot of people don't want to take the time to do that, to do the home to, and, and they don't have the courage to go back and say, you know, these friends are really not the friends that I see myself with in the next four or five years. I need, I need better friends and it's, it sucks, right? It's, it's a difficult decision. But it's a decision that will literally change your entire life, your journey, because you could you could continue your journey here this way. And, you know, no one knows where, where you'll end up. But if you start taking the time, building these new relationships, put in the work, take the time to figure out what your value is, what your purpose is, what your why is, and go into these seminars and educate yourself um, in any kind of business. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're in. Uh, you cannot go wrong taking this route because 
it might take a year, it might take five years, you will end up, you will hit your goals, you will be happy and satisfied and uh, feel fulfilled, I would say. I love it, man. Uh, th thank you so much for this. This has been an incredible conversation. Oh, really I feel cool. inspired, man. I feel inspired to go I'm do like, more. What myself. questions I'm are like, you going to ask me? You're like, no, it's going to be a, like a conversation. And I, I love that, man. Because like you, you just you're, you're talking and you're you're uh, it's an open conversation. And I love that. It's not like question answer type of uh, type of podcast. And the goal for me was and I want to share this is art of greatness is really I wanted it to be different than anything else that is out there. I want it to be story based. I want it to be more of your journey versus I feel like every podcast you go on, they ask the same fucking question. What do you recommend you agents do? What do you recommend this? What did you do? Like, I'm like, let's go. I'm tired of that. Yeah, uh, I just want to be, I want to be different. And I had so many people tell me, otherwise they're like, no, you should do this. You should make it 30 minutes. Nobody's going to watch. Nobody's going to listen. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to continue what I'm doing. I'm going to do it for a while and I'll see where it goes. I've had some well, big hitters on you, here. I'm you, thankful you for that. See authenticity, right? Exactly. And one, thank you for, thank you for doing the podcast. Thank you for bringing everyone's story out to your, to your YouTube channel and Instagram. Um, and people want to see authenticity. They don't want scripts. Uh, they they want to know the real you. Right. We know you sell real estate. We know you're really good at it. Um, and, you know, for, for other agents, you know, everyone's looking for a magic pill. There's no magic pill. We just talked about it. It's hard work and dedication. So, like, you know, this is this is more about like so telling someone's journey and everyone has that journey. The, the Everyone that you interviewed, I'm sure, uh, has a different journey. And if people take the time and listen to these to czars and you know different podcasts that you have or anyone else's and listen and just take notes a couple of nuggets from everyone of what's really uh whatever resonates with with that person that's that's the value that you're you're providing and thank you for that no i i appreciate it and thank you for all your time last thing before we wrap um who would you recommend that i interview next any two names that you would drop Two names. Any two uh, people well, that come to mind that you're like, uh, these people's story has not been fully shared the right way. And even Zars wasn't really shared. Even Narit's like, there's so many people. Right. Jordan, like, just trying you, to get. You did Santiago already? No, Santi, I haven't done. Oh, you got to do Santiago. That's for sure. Okay. He has an amazing, amazing journey and story. So that's, that's a must. And I would highly recommend my partner, Gina. She has an incredible story. They're kind of similar to my upbringing with, you know, not really having uh, uh, the people around her that, you know, the, the to hand her business. So, we're, you know, that's where we, we both resonate because we both come from, you know, hey, I'm all in. I got no one to take care of me. I'm going to take care of me. I have to do this. It's either going to work or not. So Gina and Santiago are my two recommendations. All right, it's done. Uh, and get me in touch with both. All right, let's schedule this. Let's Easy. get this wrapped Don't up. Deal. And uh, let's have fun, man. Thank you again. Thank I you appreciate so much, it. Thank you for sharing your journey to greatness. And we love you. Appreciate you. Guys, follow him on all the social channels. They pop up below. Um, you can click down there and uh, everything's there that you need. Anything else you want to plug, George? That's it, man. That's Thank it, brother. Thank you so much for your time. This has been great. And looking forward to seeing you at the forum.